Welcome back, movers and shakers. In the last episode, we spoke of seismographs placed on the moon and looked at their graphical outputs for both the moon and the earth. Today, we look at the various instruments that are used to measure quakes and the information they produce. The oldest record of a device to measure earthquakes is from China in 132 AD, invented by Chang Heng, or Choku. A modern recording instrument is called a seismograph, and it produces a time history of the shaking event and an output we call a seismogram. What Chang Heng invented was technically a seismoscope, as it did not give a time history, but only a general direction of first impulse. The dragon's jaws were cleverly connected to a pendulum, and so the first push from the seismic wave arriving would cause the dragon's jaws to open and drop the copper balls. The first ball to drop would indicate the direction to the earthquake epicenter, a still unknown distance away. The ancient owner's manual reads, when an earthquake occurs, and the bottle is shaken, the dragon instantly drops the ball, and the frog which receives it vibrates vigorously. Anyone watching this instrument can easily observe earthquakes. The same manual continues with the story. Once upon a time, a dragon dropped a ball without an earthquake being observed, and the people therefore thought the instrument of no use. But after two or three days, a notice came saying that an earthquake had taken place at Rosei. Hearing of this... Those who doubted the use of the instrument began to believe it in again. After this ingenious instrument had been invented by Choku, or Chang Heng, the Chinese government wisely appointed a secretary to make observations on earthquakes. Whew, sounds like a great job to get paid to stare at a jar. At least it was a pretty jar. Guess it was way too boring, so Dragon Ball EQ quickly went out into disuse. We mentioned in the history of earthquakes that the first scientific analysis of an earthquake in the West was Immanuel Kant's observations on the Lisbon earthquake of 1755. It was a little over a century later, in 1889, that the first seismograph was used in Potsdam, Germany, to record the shaking of a strong earthquake in Japan. This little squiggle of a line marks another huge milestone in seismology, the study of earthquakes. It also gives us a chance to clarify some of these terms. We said that Chang Heng made a seismoscope, but German astronomer Ernst von Robert Paschwitz invented, well, actually he meant to invent an instrument that would measure the gravitational effects on us from neighboring planets, but it turned out by using a horizontal pendulum and a recording wheel that he invented the first seismograph, an instrument that measures shaking over time. A seismoscope tells you the direction of an earthquake, but a seismograph gives you a record of the quake's history in your location. The part of the machine that actually responds to quakes, like the previously mentioned pendulum in Ernst's device, is called the seismometer and the record it produces is called a seismogram. Best to remember the instrument as a whole is called a seismograph. With all the bending and bouncing of various wave types, one can imagine the surface of the Earth moving in all directions during an event. Ernst's accidental seismograph only recorded horizontal motion in one direction. Modern seismograph setups usually have three seismometers, measuring all three dimensions of spatial movement. The seismometer consists of an inertial mass which stays still while the rest of the machine and surrounding land the machine's connected to move. This relative motion allows the recording device to give an electrical output which is amplified and corrected for dampened pendulum physics to get the seismogram and a measure of the actual movement. The amplification is often 1,000 times or more, so such seismographs can measure very tiny tremors that you can't even feel. They can even record the hum of the earth, caused mainly by the wind blowing through the trees, the traffic pounding the pavements, and the waves beating the shore. But this sensitivity is a problem if you are closer in and have more violent shaking. The seismograms will often clip off and have flat tops and bottoms so you can't measure the amplitude. Just as with any moving object, which can have velocity, displacement, or acceleration measured, so it is with the Earth in an earthquake. If you are in an area with potentially violent shaking that you want to record, it is better to skip the seismograph and use an accelerometer, directly measuring the acceleration of the ground.
The output we see here is called an accelerogram, and since it shows both vertical and horizontal movements, we can tease out exactly how P, S, and surface waves moved the land as they passed through. The P wave, often coming up from below first, gives a vertical push and pull, while the others add the horizontal movements in later. We can also see a seismogram in those body P waves arriving first, followed by body S waves, and those are rapidly followed by the surface Love and Raleigh waves. The tail end of the quake are not only surface waves, but extra P and S waves echoing off the Earth's interior canyon walls. We pointed out in the last episode that farther you are from the epicenter, the longer the lag between P and S wave arrival times. We know the average velocity of the P and S waves as they travel through the Earth, and thus we can calculate the distance you are from an earthquake by measuring the lag time between P and S wave arrival. Chang-Hang's seismoscope only gave general direction of an earthquake, but modern seismographs can pinpoint the exact location much more accurately. If we know the distance from the P and S wave arrival times, we can draw a circle of that distance radius around our station and say the earthquake epicenter was somewhere on that circle. If we take a second station, calculate the distance, and draw another circle, we narrow it down to two possible locations. Add a third seismograph station, repeat, and we have exactly triangulated the location of the epicenter. So you need at least three seismograph stations to find the epicenter using circles around the stations. But recall that the epicenter is just the point above the actual place in the Earth where the energy was released, called the focus, or hypocenter, of the earthquake. To find the hypocenter, you need a minimum of four stations recording the P and S arrival times, calculating their distance, and mapping spheres of those radii around them instead of circles, and find where the four or more station spheres all intersect. Using such methods, we not only get the exact location where the earthquake originated, but also the time that the energy was released. But wait, there's more! Seismographs don't just give you time and place, but also how much, that is how much energy, was released. It would be nice to have a consistent measure of energy released, but then again we are going to find that the energy, and thus shaking and damage, drops off with distance, and is influenced by underlying earth material and interferences, so an earthquake of a specific energy output will have varying influence upon the landscape, and so it seems we need Two measures at least, one that gives absolute energy, and another that measures perceived shaking and damage. The most famous absolute energy measure is the Richter scale, but more often used today is the moment magnitude scale. Uh, most people are familiar with the Richter scale, though, and the two are very similar, so we'll start with the Richter, which uses two seismograph outputs, the distance to the epicenter, and the maximum amplitude on the seismogram of the shaking at the station. Using a graphical computer as follows, we plot the distance calculated from the P and S wave lag time, and plot the maximum amplitude of the largest seismic shock recorded, and then connect the dots and read off the Richter magnitude of the earthquake. The Richter measurement is given as a whole number and a decimal, like 5.1, which would be a moderately strong earthquake. A 6.1 would be a really strong earthquake, and that might surprise one, as 6.1 is not that much bigger than a 5.1, right? Well, the secret lies in the fact that this scale is logarithmic, with each integer number being another 10 times larger amplitude of measured movement. But measured movement is not a direct measure of energy released, so with another correction, we find that every integer on the Richter scale is 31, almost 32 times more energy released than the previous number. This means a Richter scale 2 is 31 times more energy released than a Richter scale 1. A 3 is 31 times 31 times as much energy as a 1, or a 5 than a 3. If you compare a Richter scale 4 to a 1, the Richter 4 has almost 30,000 times more energy released. So, you see the energy released builds up on this scale rapidly. For comparison, the largest nuclear bomb ever detonated caused a Richter-scale earthquake of 5.1 to 5.25. 
but that bomb was detonated high in the atmosphere, so most of the energy did not go into the moderate earthquake produced. The total energy released was more like Richter 7.1, so only one one-thousandth of the energy went into the ground shaking it produced. The largest natural earthquake ever measured, the Chilean earthquake of 1960, came in with a Richter scale of 9.5, almost 3,000 times more energy than the largest nuclear bomb ever detonated, and over 100,000 times its resultant earthquake's energy. The moment magnitude scale principally used by seismologists today has a similar numerical output with values close to the more often reported Richter scale, and can be thought of in similar terms, with each number being little over 31 times more energy released. It's just a bit more precise. But as implied before, the actual shaking that comes through your neighborhood is not just a function of the total energy released, but also the distance from the epicenter, its depth, the total amount of energy that makes it to your location, and the geology directly below you. It is useful to talk about this perceived level of damage, irregardless of the energy of the earthquake at its source. The most useful of the perceived energy and damage scales is the Mercalli scale, which is much more dependent on the perception of people affected. It goes from uh, just numerical values from 1 to 12. I love reading through the Mercalli intensity scale. I recently noticed some tools on the wall of my garage doing a little dance in what I would call a Mercalli scale 1 to 2 earthquake. The quakes get more noticeable about 4 to 5, and become frightening and damaging at 6, with increasing damage from there. If we go back in time before seismographs were used to measure earthquake energy directly, only a bit over a century back, actually, we lose this data, but we can still use the Mercalli scale by reading historical accounts of people's perceptions and damage recorded. And it is the damage and the varying risks from earthquakes that will be the focus of our next episode here on Earth Explorations.